Hello everyone and welcome to uh, lecture six on the material science and engineering course. I would like to look at failure today. So what happens when materials fail? We've developed an understanding, particularly in the last lecture, about the behaviour of materials when a load is applied. So we looked at things like tensile stress, shear stress. We saw some examples of materials that are placed under quite a, a, a significant load. Uh, for example, the, the HMS Vanguard submarines that we looked at being exposed to uh, very high hydrostatic pressures and having to, to withstand those. Now, clearly, if we apply a load to a material, and if indeed if we apply, apply enough of a load, then at some point that material is going to give way and it's going to fail. Now, failure is clearly almost always undesirable. We don't build aircraft, boats, bridges with any kind of failure in mind. We need them to be incredibly reliable and, and serve a, a purpose, but also keep people safe and, and not fail in the process. The most catastrophic forms of failure in terms of aircraft breaking up in, in midair, ships being able to uh, not being able to withstand collisions with ice, icebergs, for example, or indeed you know, things like bridges collapsing. These always carry a very significant risk to life. And, and clearly, these are the most catastrophic forms of failure. But there are other reasons, good economic reasons, why we don't want materials to fail. They can lead to very, very substantial economic losses. You think if a, an oil pipeline breaks, the economic loss or the, the production loss to a company can have dire consequences, sometimes on a global scale. And then if you think about the, the, the single farmer, somebody who relies on a piece of equipment every single day to plough a field or sow seeds, that individual really doesn't want materials to fail because, again, on a, on a local scale, it leads to a lot of economic loss. But also this has negative consequences on the consumer. If you think about materials that are used now, think about the, the Amazon warehouses that you see on uh, on the Internet and, and on the television. These all rely on machines and materials, usually steel based materials, to perform jobs and get products to consumers on time. Having materials that fail have detrimental impacts on things like supply chains and getting products to consumers. And of course, we as the consumer can can uh, can suffer. And historically, there's there's a even even if we understand a material's behaviour and properties, we can't always prevent failure. And these were a, a famous series of ships that were built in World War Two called the Liberty ships, and they were used to to move oil around the United States and, and across the the Atlantic in World War Two, and the ships fractured in this incredible way, in a very brittle like way, a crack propagated around the entire hull of the ship. And this was a result of a very, very small notch in the ship's hull. And when the ship was buffeted about in the North Atlantic Sea, that crack, that very small notch grew, it propagated, and eventually it spanned the entire way around the hull of the ship and the ship essentially cracked in two. And this happened to a number of Liberty ships in the Second World War. So there's an example of the, the idea that we, we really understand those materials. The materials that that ship was built out of were not intended to fail. The manufacturer of those ships, the builder of those ships, knew a lot 
about the materials of which the, the ship was composed. They were able to machine and build a ship from them. However, something that they hadn't anticipated was the intensity with which these ships would be buffeted about in the North Atlantic Sea and the, the tension, stress and strain that that would place on the ship. So what about the fundamentals of fracture then? Well, when we speak about fracture, the first thing we think is that a body of material will separate into two or more pieces. And that will be as a result of some kind of imposed stress. Usually that stress, if you think about the application of a material in the real world, will be what we call static. So it will be a constant and slowly changing uh, stress that a material is subjected to. And importantly then, that imposed stress when we are concerned with fracture is at temperatures that are low relative to the melting point of the material. So if we build a bridge out of steel and we have that uh, ambient temperature here on Earth, we know that we are nowhere near the melting point of steel. However, the steel that a bridge is constructed from is still subjected to a constant uh, static stress. Now the applied stress can be any one of a number of stress states and we looked at some of those in the previous lecture. We are going to focus entirely on uh, a, a material that experiences a, a tensile stress or a stress in tension. And there are two types of fracture for metals. And remember that this course is largely focused on metallic substances. A metal can fracture in a, a ductile manner. And what you'll see with a ductile fracture is that you gain one piece with a very large deformation throughout the body. And it's accompanied by a significant amount of plastic deformation. Now that makes sense because if we've got one large piece with a, a large deformation that tells us that the material that has fractured has been able to withstand the applied tensile stress for quite some time. It's been able to plastically deform uh, much more slowly. Where brittle fracture is concerned we, we tend to not get large pieces. We gain many many pieces with very small deformations and here, there is little or no plastic deformation. So I, it reaches the end of the elastic limit and the material shatters. The problem is with brittle fracture is that it's often catastrophic. So if you think about a, a ship or a plane fracturing in a brittle manner, it really does just you know, blow up into, into thousands of pieces midair. That's incredibly catastrophic and it gives the, the uh, person in charge of the plane absolutely no time to, to deal with the situation. Now you see two pictures there of a ductile fracture and a brittle fracture. The terms are essentially relative okay, and they are classified entirely based on the material's ability to experience plastic deformation before fracture. So if a material is able to experience much more plastic deformation before it fractures then it's essentially fracturing with a ductile mechanism. If it can't experience any plastic deformation and it breaks up into lots of pieces, then we, we are concerned with bristle fracture. Okay, so as I said, ductile metals then exhibit a lot of plastic deformation before they uh, fracture. So if you think about a very soft metal like gold or lead, these are incredibly ductile metals and you can stretch them quite a, quite a lot before they break. You can stretch them so much in fact that they show an almost 100% reduction in area. You can also gain what we call a, a moderate ductile fracture. This is the most common type of tensile fracture for metals and their alloys. And 
you gain only very moderate necking. And what we mean by that is essentially that reduction in area as you pull or you apply tensile stress to the material. And that moderate ductile fracture occurs in several stages. So here are the stages of moderate ductile fracture. The first step is a necking process, right? So as we pull the material apart, the width of the material starts to shrink. So a classic uh, reduction in area here. The next stage is that very small cavities or micro voids form in the interior of the, uh, the cross section of the material under tensile stress. Eventually those micro voids start to enlarge and they meet each other, they coalesce to form an elliptical crack in the material. And importantly, when we've got something under tensile stress, the long axis of that crack is perpendicular to the direction of the applied load. And that crack starts to grow in direction, in, in the direction perpendicular to the applied tensile load. Now, eventually that reaches a point whereby that crack will propagate throughout the body of the material and around the perimeter of the, of the specimen or the material, and it will fracture completely. Now, when we look at this kind of fracture, we see that the, the, the fracture surface has quite irregular uh, fibrous appearance. And this tells us that at least some plastic deformation had occurred before fracture. Of course, if we're necking the sample, if it's if it's reducing in, uh, in, in, in width, then that's indicative of some kind of plastic deformation. You can often ascertain the fracture mechanism by a simple analysis of the surface, a, a, a macroscopic analysis of the surface. You can pick up the two pieces or many pieces that are fractured and you can get an idea for how a metal has fractured. A cup and cone type fracture is suggestive of a, a, a ductile fracture. If you look at that under a microscope, then you would see uh, spherical dimples. And each dimple is one half of one of those micro voids that we saw in the steps on the previous few slides. That's very different to bristle fracture then, where there's no appreciable plastic deformation and a crack very rapidly propagates throughout the material. You see a very flat surface under a brittle fracture and the crack direction is, uh, is absolutely perpendicular to the applied tensile strain. When you look at those pieces, then you'll see a very clean, flat fracture surface. If you were to look under a microscope, you would see V-shaped chevron markings. Now, when we're talking about brittle fracture, for a lot of crystalline materials, crack propagation corresponds to breaking bonds along specific crystallographic planes. These are known as cleavage or transgranular uh, fracture mechanisms. And the fracture propagates along grain boundaries. And you can see some SEM images there of a, a brittle fracture under SEM. Okay, so I want to, to move on to the idea of fracture mechanics. We've looked at the difference between brittle and ductile fracture. And we've said that we can gain some idea of fracture mechanism through a simple macroscopic or microscopic analysis of the sample. But I want to talk about um, the field of fracture mechanics. So this is a, a field that has had uh, extensive research conducted upon it over the last uh, century or so, and it aims to quantify relationships between the properties of a material 
the stress level that it experiences and the presence of any crack producing flaws and crack propagation mechanisms. Now, the measured fracture strengths, so the, the strength that needs to be applied in order to fracture a material, is found to be significantly lower than that which is predicted by theory. So if I take a piece of steel and I calculate theoretically at what point that piece of steel should fracture, but I then measure that, my measured value will be much lower than the theoretically calculated one. Now that clearly generates a problem when you're thinking about using that steel in a bridge. The reason why the measured value is lower than the theoretical value is because in any material there are microscopic flaws or cracks that will always exist under, a, under natural conditions and are a natural function of, of, of uh, entropy. These tiny flaws, or sometimes they're fun to uh, they're fun stress raises, are detrimental to the fracture strength because the stress is likely to be amplified or concentrated right at the tip of that tiny flaw or notch in a material. So there's a, a, a heat diagram, if you like, of, of stress within a material. And you'll note there's a tiny crack or a tiny flaw. And stress is concentrated right at the tip of that crack. Of course, it's then easier for that crack to propagate throughout the material. Again, here's a, here's a kind of graphical plot that if you look at that tiny little crack within a material, there's one in the bulk of the material there and one on the edge of the material in the, the, the pink diagram on the left. If we were to look at the flaw in the bulk of the material and we plot a stress profile across a cross section that goes through that crack, The magnitude of localized stress decreases as we move away from the crack tip, but at the crack tip, the stress is highest. We can calculate the maximum stress that occurs at the tip of that crack. All we need to know is the applied tensile stress that the material is experiencing, the radius of curvature of that crack tip, and the length of a surface crack or half, time, half the uh, length of an internal crack. Why? Because an internal crack has two tips and we're just calculating the stress on one of them. The equation that you use to, to calculate the maximum stress at the crack tip then makes a couple of assumptions. It assumes that the crack is elliptical in shape and it assumes that the crack runs perpendicular to applied stress. Not unreasonable assumptions to make. The crack shape may not always be elliptical, but it's likely that when we're talking about tensile stress, the crack will certainly run perpendicular to the applied load. So what does the equation tell us? Well, it tells us that if we have a very long micro crack within the sample that has a very small tip radius of curvature, then the stress that is experienced at the tip of that crack may be many times the value of the applied load. So again, think about this. You calculate a theoretical load, fracture load, that a, a steel support can take on a bridge but you negate to consider flaws within the material. Now you know that when 10 cars drive across that bridge, that doesn't get you anywhere near the fracture strength for the theoretically calculated value. So you assume that the bridge will be safe. But again, because you've negated to consider these tiny flaws within the material, your calculation is incorrect because suddenly now when 
10 cars drive over that bridge, the tips of those tiny flaws and cracks in the material experience much greater, a much greater degree of tensile strength, of tensile stress. And it makes it very likely that that crack will propagate then throughout the material, which could, of course, lead to failure. Sometimes then you can take the uh, tensile stress which is experienced at the tip of one of those flaws or cracks and divide it by the applied load and that gives you a stress concentration factor. And again, this is very simply just a, a measure, it's a ratio, uh, a measure of the degree to which that external stress is heavily amplified at these crack tips. Now, stress raisers or, or these internal flaws aren't a massive problem for ductile materials. The, the plastic deformation that these things experience means that it's not such of a, a problem. What you get then, because of the ability of the material to experience plastic deformation before it, before it fails, you gain a much more uniform distribution of stress in the vicinity of one of these flaws or cracks. However, this redistribution of stress doesn't occur in brittle materials and these cracks and, and flaws are a big problem. So you've calculated the stress that is experienced at the tip of a, cap, uh, a crack, is it possible to calculate the stress that is required for that crack to propagate in a brittle material, knowing that crack propagation often leads to failure? And of course, yes, it is. All we need to know is the modulus of elasticity of the material, the specific surface energy of the material, and the length of uh, a crack or 0.5 times the length of an internal crack. This is known as the, the critical stress, and it's the applied load that will cause one of these cracks to propagate throughout the material. What does the equation tell us then? Well, all brittle materials have these small cracks and flaws, and when the magnitude of stress at the tip of one of these flaws exceeds this critical stress value, a crack propagates. And of course, if a crack propagates throughout the material, then it leads to a fracture. You can relate the critical stress for crack propagation to the crack length, and this is known as the fracture toughness. You can see the equation on the left hand side there. It's a measure of the resistance of a material to brittle fracture when a crack is present. So that was a brief introduction to some of the concepts of fracture mechanics. But what do we do before fracture mechanics and are any of these techniques still relevant? Uh, they are, and they are used industrially. Before the advent of fracture mechanics, we used impact testing techniques. And we were interested in ascertaining the characteristics of fracture from a material at very high loading rates. And there are two standardized tests that were used to measure fracture in materials. One is called the uh, Sharpie and one is called the Izod test, and they were used to determine the impact energy that was required for a material, for a crack to propagate and a material to fracture or fail. So what you do is you take a specimen of your material of interest and you machine a V-notch into the middle of it. And you place it into a, uh, a machine that looks a little bit like this. 
your applied load is an impact then and it's an impact from a weighted pendulum and that pendulum is released from a fixed height and on the end of that pendulum is a, a knife edge or a sharp point and when that pendulum is released it strikes and fractures the specimen at the notch the notch of course is a measure for our uh, internal crack or flaw that notch is a, a stress concentrator and that pendulum continues to swing to uh, a new height h dash of course some of the energy has been absorbed by the sample being fractured and you can calculate the energy of that absorption by taking the original height of the pendulum and subtracting the h dash and that gives you a measure of impact energy and just to point out the difference between the sharpie and the isop test is the sample orientation one is vertical one is horizontal You can determine using Sharpie and Isolt tests whether a material experiences what we call a ductile to brittle transition with decreasing temperature. So have a look at the, the data in the graph on the left there. It's a plot of temperature against impact energy taken from a Sharpie impact test. A lot of steels that are used uh, industrially can exhibit what we call a ductile to brittle transition. Now this can have potentially disastrous consequences because it's telling us that at some temperature steel might fracture in a brittle manner which we know can be far more catastrophic than if something fractures in a, a more slow uh, ductile manner. And I, sh I show that on the graph here uh, for two different steels. So the steels are taken from uh, minus 40 degrees Celsius right up to about 100 degrees Celsius. And at very high temperatures, the impact energy is high, i.e. the sample has absorbed lots of energy at high temperature. If it's absorbed lots of energy, that tells us that there's quite a lot of plastic deformation going on there. So the steel is fracturing in a ductile manner. However, as the temperature is lowered, you'll note that the impact energy decreases. That's telling us that there's not much plastic deformation going on. The material is unable to absorb much energy and there's uh, a much more brittle fracture mechanism. Now, as I said, that can have really disastrous consequences and it applies for other metals and their alloys. Imagine that you have an aircraft that is built out of a material that you understand very well at temperature at temperatures on the ground but if you get that 30 to 35,000 feet up in the air where it's much colder and it undergoes a ductile to brittle transition then suddenly that material behaves in a much more brittle manner and is likely to fracture in a much more brittle manner. So having an understanding of failure at one temperature isn't enough. We need to understand how a material fails at multiple temperatures, especially if the end application of that material is likely to result, uh, is, is likely to experience wide temperature variations. If you think about the temperature variation that titanium alloys experience as they, in an aircraft, as they descend from 38,000 feet down to, you know, basically sea level, the temperature variation is huge. So I will, I'd like to talk about some other types of failure. We're not just talking about fracture here, or the consideration of these things under tensile loads. Fatigue is another kind of failure. It's a form of failure that occurs in structures which are subjected to dynamic and fluctuating stresses. So we're largely talking about bridges. They're in high winds here. Or indeed, aircraft are a, a, a classic example of something which is likely to experience fatigue over, over its long lifetime. The problem with fatigue is that it's possible for a material to fail 
at stress levels which are considerably lower than the tensile or the yield strength of a static load. So again, think about a brand new aircraft. Now in the, uh, the manufacturing plant, you might experience, you might subject that aircraft to a tensile load. You might bend wings, for example. That's static, that load is released quite quickly. Over the lifetime of the aircraft, where it experiences a constant, very dynamic and fluctuating load on the wing, for example, over time, fatigue in the material can develop. Suddenly that takes a flight one day and the load that's required to cause that material to fail is significantly lower than any of the calculations that you've made. Again, this occurs after years of service or can occur after years of service. And it's fatigue is the single largest cause of failure in metals. The problem with it is that it's quite catastrophic. It occurs very suddenly. It's the failure is often brittle like in nature, even if you've got ductile materials. You get basically zero uh, plastic deformation. And again, it occurs by these same mechanisms, the initiation and propagation of a crack. There was a very famous train crash in Versailles in 1842, following the, the, the King celebrations at the Palace of Versailles. And a train that was returning from Paris crashed after the front locomotive's axle broke. The carriages all piled into each other and 55 people died. The crash scene was analysed afterwards and it was investigated by a guy called William Rankin. And he stated in 1842 that failure was due to a crack that had propagated throughout the material and that crack had formed by a repeated stress upon the train essentially. Unfortunately his that theory was, was not widely accepted and some other really crazy theories uh, were accepted such as the idea that the metal had somehow crystallised. Now of course we now know that's that's rubbish because the metal was already a crystalline material and in fact Rankin's uh, analysis of, of the failure was far more accurate. There were, in the 50s, there were two de Havilland Comet passenger jets that broke up at midair and they crashed within months of each other. And they analysed the, the failure by immersing the fuselage into a, a pressurised water tank to replicate the, um, the experience the, uh, of the materials in midair. And it was determined afterwards that the crash was caused by a loss of, of cabin pressure at one of the windows in the roof at the front of the plane. Again, they put this down to metal fatigue, which was caused by repeated pressurisation and depressurisation of the, the aircraft. So again, we're thinking about dynamic, fluctuating environments here in fatigue. And it was also discovered that the stresses around the, uh, the, the windows in the, in the cabin were considerably higher than anticipated. And you'll note that all of the windows on this plane are square. The result, therefore, was that all future airliners would feature windows with round corners and that reduces stress concentration. So the reason why windows on planes are round is because of the, the failure and fatigue that the de Havilland Comet experienced. There was a, an, air, an airline crash in 1988, um, Aloha Airlines 243. 
experienced an explosive decompression and structural failure. Again, the cause was metal fatigue, which was aggravated by something called crevice corrosion. And this goes back, this example goes back to the idea that whilst we can have an understanding of a material, it doesn't necessarily always prevent failure if we don't carefully consider the environment in which that material is expected to operate. Because this particular plane was uh, going back and forth between Hawaii and the west coast of the United States. And because of that, the plane was operating constantly in very humid and salty environments. And the stress cycling that operated on the fuselage resulted in uh, this ultimate uh, decompression failure as a result of constant short hop flights. There was a uh, very disastrous capsizing of an oil platform called the Alex L. Keeland oil platform and it was a Norwegian semi-submersible drilling rig and it capsized in 1980. On the evening the wind was at about 40 knots and the waves were 12 meters high and at 6 30 a sharp crack was heard followed by the, the whole unit trembling. The rig healed over by 30 degrees stabilized and it was soon realised that five of the six anchor cables had snapped uh, and there was just one remaining anchor cable that was preventing the rig from capsizing entirely. 20 minutes later, that remaining anchor cable snapped and the rig turned upside down. Now, the rig collapsed because of a fatigue crack in one of the six bracings that held it in place. And that fatigue was traced back to a very small six millimeter fillet weld, which joined a, an entirely non load bearing plate to the bracing. Okay, so another kind of failure is creep. And um, I'm not allowed to give any kind of idea of my uh, political persuasion, as it were, but I typed creep into Google Images and these two images came up. So I'll let you draw your own conclusions. Materials are, are often placed in service at high temperatures and composed to and exposed to static mechanical stresses. And we term such deformation under those circumstances creep. It is the time dependent and permanent deformation of materials when subjected to a constant load or stress. We don't want this kind of failure. It's often undesirable and it's often the limiting factor in the lifetime of a part. Because we're talking about materials at higher temperatures, we're only really concerned by creep when temperatures are around about 40% of the, the metal's melting point. So, as I said, it concerns the, the deformation or something we call the creep strain of a sample if it's under constant load and constant temperature and it's measured as a function of time. And it happens in three distinct stages. There's a, a kind of pre-creep stage, so that's why I put four in brackets there. So we've got our metal and it's put into operation at an elevated temperature. The minute we apply a load to the metal, there's going to be some kind of instantaneous deformation. That happens for every material. That deformation is completely elastic in, material, in nature and once we've applied that instantaneous load, we can then divvy up the resulting creep strain versus time curve into three regions. 
So the first one, I mean, I put the second one here because we've already discussed the pre-creep strain, but is the, the primary creep strain. So this is where we have a continuously decreasing creep rate. And it's associated with the material being able to experience an, an increase in resistance or strain hardening. And we'll speak about this in a couple of lectures time, but I'm going to introduce it here. Basically, the de deformation becomes a little bit more difficult because we're applying a load to the material and actually initially becomes slightly stronger. Secondary creep then ensues where we have this uh, rate of creep that is constant. This is the middle portion of the graph here. It's the step with the longest duration and the rate is constant. So the gradient of that graph is constant uh, because we've got a balance between what, what we term strain hardening and deformation. Finally, at the, the final stage, the creep rate increases up to the failure of the material. Now, if you think about it, the, we've got to consider some design factors here. That secondary portion known as the, uh, which is where we, the, 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 the rate of creep strain is constant, is the most important for long life applications. So think about things that we need to use at elevated temperatures in uh, situations like a nuclear power plant. These need to operate over several decades. We can't keep replacing things in a power plant. So we need to extend that middle portion of the graph when we're talking about things that will have a long lifetime. If something has a short lifetime, so think about a, a, a military aircraft, for example, the most important thing is that time to rupture. Now, Temperature can massively impact the level of creep strain. And you can see how temperature uh, massively impacts creep strain now. It's far quicker for a material to rupture or fail when the temperature is higher. And we can link that steady state creep rate in the middle of the creep rate uh, graph to stress and temperature using the equation there. OK, so engineering materials are not as strong as we might predict from theory. That's owing to the presence of flaws and, and micro cracks, which act to concentrate stress within the material. We've looked at some fracture mechanics. We've looked at some slightly more old fashioned impact testing techniques and we've looked at fatigue and creep. And at the end of this lecture on the handout are some uh, practice questions with answers for you to have a look at.